Hello and welcome everybody um, to uh, our workshop today. My name is Karen Lawson and I'm a clinical psychology working in the Battersea Mental Health Support Team um, and my colleague Ruby is also with us today so I'll let her introduce herself. Hi I'm Ruby, I'm an occupational therapist in the Battersea Mental Health Support Team. So just to give you a brief overview of um, the Batty Mental Health Support Team and what we do, we're an early intervention and prevention service um, for child and adolescent mental health. So we work with around 20 schools in the Battersea area and we offer a range of support. Um, so that includes parent led guided self help for children who are experiencing anxiety or behavioural difficulties. We offer workshops such as this one that we're doing today. Um, and we also offer support and training to school staff um, around children's emotional well being. And today's session as you'll see is titled lockdown learning and children's emotional well-being and we've put this workshop together based on um, parent feedback who have said that supporting their children with um, lockdown learning has been one of the things that they've re really struggled with at the moment um, so we won't be able to uh, cover everything today and there's lots of different things that could be involved in that um, and we won't focus so much on the academic side of things but what we want to think about is how you can support your child with their emotional well-being um, and Ruby's also going to talk about sensory regulation um, to help get them in a place where they're ready to learn. So to start with I just wanted to give a brief outline of what we'll cover in today's session. So we're going to look at um, the challenges of lockdown learning we're going to think about um, emotional regulation and sensory regulation um, and then throughout we'll be thinking about um, some practical tools to help um, address some of the common emotional and behavioural kind of challenges that you might be seeing at the moment. And that at the end of the session we just want to focus a bit on um, self-care because um, we know um, that kind of that's one thing for parents that can often go neglected at the moment but that's something that's really important um, in terms of um, being able to support children. <coughs> So we wanted to start the presentation today by acknowledging some of the challenges that the current circumstances have thrown our way. So we know that families are under a kind of stress that they've never experienced before. So you might have felt that your family was thriving before the um, coronavirus pan pandemic, or you might have been uh, already struggling with different aspects of life. But I think it's pretty fair to say that you probably never expected to face a global pandemic. And one of the biggest challenges as I've highlighted um, that we've heard parents talk about is managing the various roles of being a teacher, being a parent, working and everything else in between and often all of it at the same time. So it's not only confusing, um, but it's also something that parents never really felt prepared for. And along with that, there's all of these other current challenges um, that we've highlighted on this slide. So time for um, limited social connection, <clears throat> change in behaviour in children, prolonged time together, a mix of environments, home and school in the same place. And we know that parents who are homeschooling didn't make that decision voluntarily, um, but have been put in this really challenging situation. And we think that um, it's probably helpful perhaps to consider um, kind of lockdown learning as crisis education, um, and it might be helpful to reframe it um, as that. <clears throat> so we also wanted to highlight the impact of these challenges on both parents and children. So I'm not sure um, if this slide resonates with any of you, um, but a psychologist called Dr. Marta Diros Calado um, asked some parents what they are struggling with at the moment, and she had over 500 responses. So she did a quick analysis of the responses, and it's not a rigorous research study, um, but this slide shows a summary of what is happening in parents' own words. So there was a big theme of not feeling enough or doing enough. And that was with children, in work life, with house chores, self-care, or even doing enough with um, the hours in the day. And at the same time, parents were also experiencing children um, feeling scared, anxious, fearful, um, but also bored, sad, alone um, and disappointed and often showing quite intense emotions. And parents were often experiencing these emotions at the same time. Um, and she acknowledges there's this huge mismatch between the things you have to do, what you want to do and what your children needs, which is often connection. And that all together is a huge and impossible task. Um, and there's just a lot being expected of both parents and children at the moment. <clears throat> 
And while parenting during a pandemic is something that no one would have ever wished for, um, we think that although it might feel like everything is standing still at these times, that actually it does still offer opportunities for growth. Um, and we want to think about and to share some ideas today about how you might be able to support your children um, during this time in developing kind of um, in their emotional well-being um, and skills to help with that. So on the last slide, we touched on some emotions that children may be feeling at the moment. But this slide shows the vast array of emotions children might be experiencing right now. And these emotions can often change hour to hour, day to day, often with a mixture of all of these feelings at the same time. And considering where children are in their development, and we'll see that children have missed out on lots of experiences that they were due to have, um, such as end of school um, experiences, uh, sitting exams, they've been working towards birthday parties, seeing families, all of these feelings are completely understandable. Um, and it also might be helpful to think about whether you've noticed any of these feelings in your own children and also whether you've noticed um, any of these feelings in yourself um, with regards to lockdown. So the feelings that we discussed on the previous slide might be expressed in a variety of different ways. And often for younger children who don't necessarily have the emotional language um, to let parents know exactly how they're feeling, it might be communicated through their behaviour. So you might notice some of these behaviours around more often at the moment, so not wanting to get out of bed, withdrawing from others, um, shouting, hitting, slamming doors, tantrums, um, maybe being more clingy or reassurance seeking. Um, so you might have noticed kind of a change in your child's behaviour. And you might also notice some more of these sayings, things like, I hate you, I can't do it, I'm stupid, I'm not doing it. Um, and these might be, be particularly in response to um, having to kind of learn from home and also um, for getting used to you as a, a, a teacher in a different role. And although these images are of younger children, we know the words and emotions expressed um, are common in children of all ages and often um, even up to kind of adolescence as well. So uh, we've highlighted some of the challenges that parents and children may be facing at the moment, and how these might be impacting on children's emotional and behavioural wellbeing. So we want to now move on to think about how parents can support children. So we're going to focus on um, what parents have told us that they're really struggling with at the moment. So we're going to look at um, emotional and behavioural regulation. Uh, we're going to look at sensory regulation. We're going to spend a bit of time thinking about motivation and also, as I mentioned before, how you can look after yourselves. So we just wanted to start um, with looking at emotional regulation and what that is. Um, so emotional regulation is your ability to manage your emotions um, and your behaviour in the context of the situation you find yourself in. So it's a, the person's ability to process and express express their feelings in a constructive, constructive way. So the kind of things that involves um, is being able to talk about your feelings, being able to calm yourself down when you're upset, being able to use effective regulation strategies in the moment, and being able to pause and think things through when you're angry or frustrated and not acting on impulse. And learning to self-regulate is a key milestone in child development. So children aren't born with it. It's something that is learned over time. And there's a number of different factors that are involved in that process um, and also um, different factors that influence a child's ability to um, regulate their emotions, things such as temperament and developmental status um, and age. But we know one of the key factors is parental environmental support, and that's the one thing that we want to focus on um, today. So I also wanted to quickly touch on what it may look like if your child is emotionally dysregulated. So emotional dysregulation is feeling like you can't control the way you respond to stresses, and it's a totally normal response to a pandemic. So in children, emotional dysregulation can look different and mean different things. So it might be internalising emotions, such as withdrawal or silence, maybe be appearing distracted, um, more anxious or panicky. Or it might be more externalising behaviours, such as tantrums and meltdowns, um, shutting down, aggression, storming off. And um, it can also look as though um, your child may be aggressing um, at the moment. So it might be that they are acting younger than they are, or it might be that um, they're uh, 
emotional regulation skills are um, at a stage that was below what they were previously. So if your child is reacting more negatively to things they're experiencing at the moment, they're de definitely not alone. Um, so during times of stress, um, it can be really difficult to control or regulate our emotions. So we might react more negatively um, or intensely to things that normally wouldn't bother us. And you might as well notice that um, in yourself as well at the moment. So we can think about emotional regulation on a scale and you might be familiar um, with um, this slide, which is the slide uh, zones of regulation. Um, so the zones of regulation um, are sometimes used in schools and they can be a really useful way um, of visualising for both parents and children um, kind of a child's emotional temperature. Um, and on this slide, you can see the green zone um, shows where a child is emotionally regulated. So when they're calm, happy um, and when they're in turn in a place where they're ready to learn. Um, and then um, a child is um, who is emotionally dysregulated, maybe in the blue, yellow or um, red zone. And on this slide, this is another way of looking at emotional regulation and a theme that we'll use throughout um, both the emotion um, and sensory regulation aspects of today's talk. Um, and especially um, Ruby will um, think a bit more about this when she talks about sensory regulation. So if we think about how a child might be feeling and behaving, it can be useful to think about Eeyore, Winnie the Pooh and Tigger. So for optimal learning, children want to be like Winnie the Pooh in the green zone. But we know that the seesaw can tip to either kind of Eeyore, where they're more kind of um, uh, under aroused, say sad, sick, tired, or it can tip to um, Tigger, where they're more over aroused. Um, and that's when we might see kind of the more frustrated, worried, um, wriggly, wriggly, kind of excited um, presentations. So we'll be coming back to this um, as we move on throughout the talk. So um, what we want to move in on to now, um, and I'm sure which is um, kind of the most important part for you, is to think about what you can do to help um, your children with their emotional regulation. So there are many different ways to support children with this, but there are four main areas that we want to focus on today. So to start with, we want to think a bit about how we can promote an environment where children feel comfortable to talk um, about how they are feeling. Uh, and when they feel comfortable, um, they then need to have the words to express themselves and to develop skills and strategies to help with regulating emotions. Um, and lastly, um, they often look to um, us, to adults, to see how we manage our feelings, both good and bad, um, and to learn from what they see. So then we want to think about kind of modelling emotional regulation. So we know that one of the key factors in supporting emotional regulation skills in children is having a stable and supportive home environment. So family life isn't always smooth um, and we know no one is a perfect parent. However, what we do know is that when children feel safe, loved and secure at home, despite the inevitable ups and downs that come with family life, um, they'll be much better able to manage other difficult situations or emotions. So this may be even more important at the moment where children are spending much more time at home and with parents. And although you may feel like you're spending a lot of time um, with children at the moment, it's also important to kind of factor in quality time together. So even if that's just 10 minutes a day um, of um, child led play where your child has your undivided attention and they get to lead an activity, that can make a real difference. And it might also sound really obvious, but reminding your child that you are there to support them when things are difficult um, can also really help them to feel supported. So even if you think that you show that, sometimes children just need to hear um, that. So something like, I'm here to help you if you're struggling, let me know. And another key factor um, is stability and consistency at home. So although this may feel really hard at the moment, um, it can maintain one of the things that research researcher Anne Maston calls ordinary magic. So she says ordinary, ordinary magic comes from the feeling of predictability and structure at home. So although it might not feel like anything special, um, showing children how to maintain schedules and routines such as consistent bedtimes and meal times, movement times, work times and play times um, can be really helpful in containing emotions. So predictability we know can feel very safe in a really uncertain world at the moment and that can prevent the big emotions that come with kind of lots of change and unpredictability. 
And another way to support and foster emotion regulation is ensuring children feel able to talk and express their emotions at home. So that means opening up an environment where it's OK to talk about emotions, which helps children to develop the language they need to express how they're feeling and teaches them um, appropriate and helpful ways of managing emotions. So children need to learn it's OK to talk about their emotions rather than bottle them up, um, which we know then often results in the outbursts um, we have talked about um, previously. Um, so it's really important that we um, provide opportunities for children to talk and we're going to um, move on to thinking about a, a bit about how we can do that. So I want to talk a bit about emotional coaching and the aim of this is to support children to recognise their feelings um, and then in turn to understand and express um, emotions in different um, in healthy ways. Um, so for children, being able to identify and express how they're feeling is one of the first steps in being able to regulate their emotions. So children who can recognise and tell you how they're feeling are much better able to manage those feelings and to receive the kind of help um, when they need it. And this can be really hard for a child to develop on their own and they often need the support of parents and adults around them to coach them through this. So there are four main things parents can do to help coach their ch children um, to help them understand and make sense of their emotional experiences. So this involves noticing emotions, labelling emotions, listening and then validating emotions. And we're going to talk through this um, briefly now. So you might remember this slide that we talked about a little bit earlier. So I want you to think for a moment about how you typically respond if your child says this or similar statements or has difficulty kind of managing their behaviour, such as shouting, screaming or throwing things. So these might be some of the statements that you're hearing um, at the moment in response to lockdown learning. <clears throat> so here are some common responses and what we might call parent traps. So these are the things that parents often do. So with statements that might be particularly emotive, like I hate you, or if a child says um, something mean to their sibling or um, and a, a parent might want to leap straight into the telling the child off and even ban them from saying such a thing. And if you tend to take these things with a pinch of salt, you might find yourself drawn into a response such as, oh, don't be silly, it's not like that type of response. So refuting what your child is saying. Or if you're prone to worrying about your child, you might take on more of a questioning response. So wanted to more, know more to find out why your child is feeling like this or you might try to persuade them out of how they're feeling. So you might want to provide alternative evidence, say, don't say that, you're so clever, or yesterday you said I was the best mummy. And then if you're more of a practical person, you may be drawn into giving advice or trying to help your uh, child problem solve. And lastly, if you're stressed and tired, you might just close it down altogether or ignore it as you just don't have the energy to deal with it. So none of these responses are necessarily wrong and we all do them some of the time. However, when adults take charge of um, the situation and try to manage it for their child, they often really miss the emotion that's behind um, the behaviour. So what can you do instead? So as we highlighted, it might be helpful to try the four stages of noticing, labelling, listening and validating. So the first step is noticing your child's emotions. So this means becoming aware of signs your child's emotions may be changing. And this might be changes in their body, such as getting red, clenched fists, um, frowning or changes in their behaviour, such as throwing, shouting, um, withdrawing. And you'll know your child best and what signals an emotional change for them. But it's really important to highlight, we can often see the behaviour or the statement, something like, I hate you or I can't do it, um, which is often the tip of the iceberg. Um, but what's really important is trying to think what emotion might be underlying that. So to remember to hold in mind that um, words and behaviour are all communications of emotions. So once you've noticed that your child might be emotionally dysregulated or be struggling to manage some um, big emotions, try to help them become aware of the emotions. So children might find this really difficult, but we know that naming feelings can have a really significant effect on um, their experience. So you might have heard the frame before, you, um, the phrase, sorry, um, you have to name it to tame it. So it can be helpful um, for children to learn the vocabulary um, to identify the feelings um, themselves. So um, and naming a feeling can really reduce the impact of that um, feeling on um, someone. 
And it's best not to tell a child how they're feeling, so you might be wrong, um, but start to offer suggestions such as, I wonder if, or I've noticed that, or it sounds like, and link this to what's happened or what you notice, so your child can start to make the connections between um, their behaviour um, or their um, kind of um, physical sensations um, and um, how, how they make them feel. And once you've named your child's emotions, this then provides the opportunity for them to tell you whether you're right or wrong. So if your child is ready to talk, let them know that you are listening and you're interested in understanding their experience. So really listen to what's being expressed um, being completely present. So not being distracted or half in the conversation. Give them your kind of full attention. Um, without kind of judging, asking questions or giving advice, um, which we can often really kind of want, naturally want to do. Um, but it's really important to resist the temptation to do that because listening really encourages children to open up um, and share um, information about their um, feelings, which also helps them to kind of process and to um, learn that emotional language to um, talk about um, their emotional experiences. And finally, one of the key aspects of emotion coaching is validating how your child's feeling. So offer, offering validation communicates that feelings and thoughts are accepted, that they make sense and they're understandable. And you can do this by initially reflecting on and summarising what they have expressed um, and shared with you, and then to show that you understand why they are having that um, reaction. So even if you don't understand why they feel that way, um, because that it can be really difficult to understand another person's perspective. Um, it's still really important to acknowledge um, the feelings and that they matter. So some of the samples of this um, are shown um, include things like, it makes sense that you're really upset about not seeing your friends. I think I would feel like that too. Or I understand it can be really scary to try new things. So it's really important to remember that even if you validate feelings, it doesn't mean that you have to condone, condone the behaviour. So you can still put limits in place on um, behaviour and what's acceptable. Um, so you can say that you understand why your child is angry um, and it's OK to be angry, but it's not OK to hit your brother or it's OK to um, shout at your mum. <clears throat> and just wanted to highlight um, just briefly that timing is really key um, so think about when it's time to intervene and talk and when it's time not to so I'm sure you'll all recognize um, the need for a child to calm down first um, so they're not going to be able to um, kind of listen or reason when they're in a high state of um, arousal um, so don't try to talk about things too early or to um, expect an apology from your child. Um, perhaps the best way is to help them to do something different. So to walk away, to go to a quiet or safe space um, and to use some strategy, emotional regulation strategies um, that we're going to talk about next. So another way to support children with emotion regulation is to help them to develop the skills to be able to calm themselves down and to regulate their own um, emotions because we know that um, adults aren't always going to be around to support them to do this. So we don't have enough time to go into all of these today, um, but the coping skills displayed on this side are some of the strategies that might be useful um, to practice with children to help bring themselves back into the green um, or regulated zone that we discussed earlier. So uh, the first one is breathing and relaxation um, strategies. And these might sound really simple, but they can be really effective in helping children to calm down. So when a child's experiencing um, feelings of stress and even us as adults, when we are, um, you'll notice that your breathing will change. So um, much more likely to take in um, short, shallow breaths through the um and uh, yeah, taking short, shallow breaths um, and we might notice our heart rate kind of speeding up. Um, and what's really helpful is to um, to regulate that is to practice the breathing exercise. So taking in a slow breath through the nose, holding the breath for a few seconds um, and then ex exhaling that slowly throughout the mouth. And this will help your child to focus on something other than their thoughts and their worries. Um, and once their breathing is slowed and regulated, um, they're likely to feel much more calmer. Um, and one um, strategy you might want to look up online is um, called balloon breathing. Um, and you can um, 
use um, this with your child um, to help kind of practice. And it's really important to practice that in um, times when they are feeling regulated so that they feel able to draw on that um, maybe when they're um, feeling um, more dysregulated. Mindfulness can also be really helpful for children um, so it can help to refocus their attention to the present moment um, and there are lots of videos on YouTube and apps and audios um, that you can find for this. So it can be useful to practice this um, as I mentioned before again um, when your child's kind of feeling calm so that they um, kind of master the ability to be able to do this um, and then it's much easier to use it when um, they're not able to kind of think so clearly. Uh, another strategy might be able to um, uh, uh, create a calm down corner, so having a designated area within your home where your child um, can take a break um, can be really helpful um, when your child's feeling um, kind of overwhelmed. And this might require a bit of prompting from you at first, so um, something like, I notice you're really frustrated, why don't you go to the calm down corner for a few minutes? Um, and it can be really useful also to think about some um, calming toys um, or um, sensory tools um, that you can um, have in this um, space, so such as fidget toys or squeeze balls, um, and Ruby's going to talk a bit more um, about that in a few seconds. Um, and the last thing we just want to touch on is distraction. So this um, can be anything that works for your child. So it might be kind of iPads, listening to music, playing a game, colouring. Um, and we sometimes call them flow activities. So um, these can be activities that um, take your child's full attention. Um, so it kind of um, takes their attention away from um, that emotional experience and the feelings that they might be feeling in their body or the thoughts that they're having um, until their body kind of um, calms down and in a more regulated um, state where you're able to have um, a conversation and reflect on what's happened um, and think more about kind of problem solving. And I just wanted to show um, this slide. Um, so you can develop a um, coping skills menu with your child. Um, so um, that can include some of the strategies that we've discussed or strategies that you know that work really well for them. Um, and this can be helpful for you to collaboratively do together um, and that you can use in those moments where um, there's lots of big feelings around. Um, and it might be hard to think in those moments about what um, strategy to use but if there's a, uh, a menu of choice um, you can suggest to your child um, to pick something to help them in that moment. Um, and finally um, it's really important for parents to kind of model good emotional regulation um, and I think we all know that children often copy what we do before they do what we say. Um, so we know that how you identify and respond to stressors in your daily um, kind of environment will be the best teacher um, for children um, for how they can help um, uh, to develop their own emotional regulation skills. Um, and as we said previously, um, showing your child that it's good to talk about feelings um, by talking about your own can be really helpful um, and also talking about appropriate ways um, in that you're kind of managing your your feelings so um, something like I'm getting really frustrated with my laptop because it's not working I'm going to go and have a cup of tea and maybe I'll be able to work out what to do when I've calmed down and then the last thing that I just wanted to touch on briefly is um, managing kind of oppositional behavior so you might find that children who are struggling with big emotions, um, it can present as um, more kind of the oppositional behaviour. You might have found this more often at the moment where you're being required to ask more of your children um, and when they're um, experiencing you in different, um, different roles and accepting you kind of as a teacher. And we know that oppositional behaviour is a core feature of child development. So it represents the testing of boundaries by children and adolescents um, as they encounter new kind of social rules. And like um, any other of the behaviours we've talked about um, kind of throughout this workshop, it's still really important to acknowledge and validate validate your child's um, feelings but you might also want to think about some of the behavioural strategies as well to help um, so I'm just going to share some of those um, with you now. So the first thing is to um, remain calm yourself and um, so it can be really easy um, for us as well to become kind of emotionally dysregulated and to kind of feel frustrated um, and angry um, but 
remember that it's okay to delay your response you don't need to do it do it straight away there and then if you need some time to kind of walk away and to calm yourself down and um, then that's okay and if you're finding that your child um answers back qu quite often and um can often get into arguments when you've asked them to do something one thing that can be helpful is to calmly restate the agreed rule say for example we agreed that you would turn the telly off at six o'clock and there although it might feel like um bending the rules in, and giving in to your child can be um easier and present prevent the escalation um in behavior we know that um often this can only this might be beneficial in the short term but it can lead to more difficulties um in the long term so try and um to make um, rules and expectations clear and consist consistent. So I let you know that you had to do 30 minutes of work before you could play on the PlayStation. And as we mentioned before, although children may sometimes find rules and boundaries kind of difficult, actually they can be really containing and help them to know kind of what's expected of them. And another strategy we just wanted to highlight is um, forced choice. So this is simply providing a limited set, um, set of choices for your child to make. So this can take the um, form of asking them whether they um, would like to do maths or English first. And it enables them to have some autonomy and control over what they do, but in a realistic way um, and often with the same outcome. Um, so would you rather do your homework and then have a bath or would you uh, rather have a bath and then do your homework? Um, and this often um, yeah, empowers your child and gives them a bit more sense of control and agency over what they're doing. And we know that parents can often get into the habit of telling their child not to do a certain behaviour um, without providing alternative examples of what they should do. So rather than telling your child um, what you don't want them to do, so um, instead of saying um, don't shout, can you say, can you talk quietly please? Um, and this gives them a more concrete example um, of what they can do um, instead. Um, and then finally, um, the last thing is um, to try um, is using when then commands. Um, so this helps your child to know the positive consequences of complying with a command. Um, so when you finish the four mass problems, then you can have a break. Um, and uh, this also helps with breaking um, activities down into smaller chunks, um, which might feel more kind of manage manageable and less overwhelming for um, children. So now I'm going to hand over to Ruby, who's going to talk more about kind of sensory regulation. Thanks, Karen. So now we'll talk about sensory regulation. Um, it's another way to help your child to feel ready to learn um, and We'll be using the seesaw diagram again to try and illustrate this for you. So before any of us can learn or do functional tasks, our bodies and specifically our central nervous system um, have to be in a regulated state. So this is done through our senses, um, which is why we call it sensory regulation. All of us are processing sensory information all the time um, and it's constantly impacting our day to day lives and taking us up and down the seesaw. Um, ideally, most of the time we will fall somewhere in the middle where we need the poo is. And this is where our nervous system is calm. So we're calm and it helps us to focus and learn and to work. However, if our body is feeling dysregulated, it can be hard to process other skills, um, including academic learning, but also it can be really hard to regulate our emotions, um, to focus, to moderate our energy levels and or our behaviour. So dysregulation can kind of fall into two categories. So you might have someone that's too low. So we have Eeyore representing this. And this is where the nervous system is running slower than normal. Um, someone might present as quite low energy. We sometimes call it low arousal. And here you might have a child that finds it really hard to get up in the morning. They might be quite lethargic, doing things quite slowly, um, sleepy, withdrawn. They also might present with low, low emotion, so like sad, bored. Um, and it's important to note that um, sensory regulation overlaps with the emotional side of things that Karen spoke about. So it can affect your mood as well. 
on the other side of the seesaw, we have someone who's too high, represented by Tigger. Um, and this is where the nervous system is running faster than usual. And we call this high arousal. Um, so someone might be quite high energy, um, bouncing about, um, not able to sit still and do the work they need to do. Children showing these behaviours may be the children that are struggling with not being on the move all the time. They really benefited from being active, um, the school run, like uh, playing sports in the or or, or playtime. Um, and now they might be kind of presenting as very hyper, distracted, frustrated, um, maybe quite irritable and even angry. So, like I've said, we all have a tendency to be on this seesaw at different points in the day or depending on what's going on in our lives. Um, and your child's no different. So there are some people that might feel really sleepy after lunch, some people who bounce out of bed in the morning. Um, and there are luckily quite a few practical strategies that you can work into you and your child's day to help them move towards the just right spot. So we'll start with having a think about some calming activities. So these are for our tiggers, um, our higher arousal, um, who might be distractible, can't stay still, um, irritable. So the following activities help the nervous system to calm down. Um, movement activities which are slower repetitive and heavy work for the body's muscles um, can be very calming for the nervous system so these might be press ups on the wall um, or on the floor um, you might get them to carry heavier items in a rucksack so this could be toys water whatever you have around the house um, but just bear in mind, not more than 5% of your child's weight. Um, you might get them to do household chores like um, laundry, ca carrying other heavy items like tidying books onto shelves, um, hoovering, um, garden like errands, chores like watering the plants. And, and these are quite good ones because they kind of disguised as, as errands rather than sensory activities. You may play wheelbarrows with them where the child walks on their hands with the adult holding their legs. Um, gentle bouncing on the trampoline, but it has to be gentle. Um, swinging on or um, uh, rocking on a rocking chair. And something like bike riding up hills because it gives a lot of resistance. Um, to the body which can be really calming. Some other calming activities so chewing or sucking activities can be really calming um, for example chewy snacks like dried fruit, um, chewy sweets, chewy fruit bars, dried meat and also drinking through a sports water bottle or a straw as you can see in the picture as it gives extra work to the body mostly through your mouth and that can be really calming as well. You can also get chewy pencil toppers um, and things like that from the internet if you find that's really useful for your child. Squeezing a stress ball um, and you can make your own with a balloon filled with flour. This can also be something that goes in your calm down corner perhaps. Kitchen, bread making, kneading dough, um, stirring the cake mix, anything that provides a bit of resistance um, and hard work for the body. And um, lying on your tummy to do work or to watch TV or to play games, because when you lift your head, as you can see in the picture, you're working against gravity, which is giving your body a bit of that um, feedback, which can be calming. And a quiet space can be calming, um, <clears throat> as we've kind of mentioned, maybe a corner somewhere or you can make a den with like um, chairs and a sheet or the bottom bunk, depending on what's available to you. It can also have dim lighting and 
a predictable routine is also really can be a calming structure for children. And hugs. So these are deep pressure activities. So they give a huge amount of feedback to the body's muscles, which in turn can calm us. So you can encourage your child to give themselves a hug or you give them a tight hug. Um, similarly, um, the hot dog game where you wrap your child up tightly in a blanket, lying down and pretend to make a hot dog. So you use lots of different pressure on them, which might be like kneading or chopping them. Um, or the, a hamburger game. So here they use they're using hamburger props, but you can use like cushions and blankets. Um, so your child lies on the floor on a cushion and then you pile different layers of the burger on top of them. Um, and then you squish down the burger and they climb out and because that provides lots of nice and deep pressure for them. Um, and massages, whether it's the hands, feet, back, head, firm, firmly is, is the key here. Um, and you can do this for your child or you can also encourage it as something that helps them self-regulate. So let's move on to alerting activities. Um, so to help with low arousal, so our eels who are maybe a little bit withdrawn quietly in their own world, they might be a bit slumped and lethargic, um, not very responsive. You might find that they don't really register what's going on around them. So maybe you come into a room and, and they don't really notice. Um, so we need activities that are alerting. So movement activities that are alerting are fast, they're unpredictable, have lots of changes in direction um, and not high resistance um, as with the previous slides. So for example you might have fast trampolining um running games which change direction a lot um and other sports such as tag it football um skipping obstacle courses um you can make these at home with just simple th simple things um jumping and crashing from the sofa onto cushions and repeatedly doing this quite fast is alerting bouncing on a space hopper or a bouncy ball and swinging or being spun around but fast is kind of the key and you can also do this in the playground so roundabout slides that kind of thing. Um, as a rule, try not to encourage more than 10 minutes of an alerting activity because it is possible to become too alert um, and you just kind of need to gauge what your child is, is feeling and, and what works best for them. Some other alerting activities are um, having a shower in the morning, particularly a cold shower is helpful um, and fast moving touch so maybe quickly drying them with a towel um, after the shower and fast moving less predictable music jazz is a good example of this but it can be lots of different things right, lights um, opening the curtains having lots of light throughout the day um, light touch as i've mentioned or tickling can be alerting Changing the routine, so kind of having some structure, but having some variety within that can help. And strong flavoured food, so whether it's spicy, sour um, and also crunchy textures can be alerting. So just a few things to remember about sensory regulation, but also emotional regulation. Um, everyone's just right spot is different. So realistically, um, no one's going to be right in the middle all day, every day. Um, and you know your child, you know their personality, you'll be able to figure out what works best for them. Um, and it can be a combination of all the different strategies. And it's good to bear in mind both the sensory regulation strategies, but also the emotional regulation strategies. Um, and you can use them alongside each other. I think often um, a little bit of trial and error um, is, is, is 
what will work. Um, so being too low or being too high is not necessarily negative. We're not trying to say that um, we all move between the states, as I've said, but it's just when we get to the extreme ends of either one and it stops us from working or learning um, or becomes distressing that it's useful to have the strategies um, to help us reduce this. So also important to know that everyone responds differently to the strategies and some will work better than others for each individual child and some people are more sensitive um, and they might need a lot or they might need lots to even have an effect so just work, find out what works for your child and what works for your family um, yeah so these tips work for grown-ups too and if you're feeling like you're tipping towards one of the edges of the seesaw um, you can use the strategies that we've mentioned and as we've also talked about it's really good modelling for your child. Lastly um, you can encourage your child to self-regulate so think about where they are on the seesaw or on a feelings thermometer um, and kind of once they've identified where they are help them think about how they can get to the just right area. So what strategies do they need to use to get there? Um, it can take a few practices for your child to be able to do this, but once they get there, it can be a really useful tool to help them understand themselves better and it helps them to manage how they feel independently. Um, so I'm going to move on to talk briefly about low motivation now um, why it happens and what you can do. Um, so as you may have experienced yourselves there are many reasons that someone can feel or appear unmotivated um, some of the most common reasons are um, it can be to do with regulation so maybe kind of like the eeyores that we talked about um, which can appear as very low motivation but sometimes it's more to do with how the body's functioning and those strategies can be helpful it can also be because of mood, it can be to do with the changes in routine that we've spoken a lot about due to COVID, um, it can be due to do with the environment, maybe there's distractions um, and also it can be to do with like feelings of low confidence in your abilities and also to do with being interested in what's going on. So um, we'll have a little think about the strategies that might help with this. So I think firstly basic motivation, so it's important to acknowledge that everyone's likely to be struggling a bit with motivation at the moment and it might be realistic to start with basic motivation before you can even get your children onto the lessons, so maybe just starting with an activity of their choice or just some quality time. Secondly, um, using the techniques that me and Karen have both spoken about, so the emotional and sensory techniques um, and acknowledging that it's not necessarily that your child is lazy or disinterested, but their body and brain might just need to wake up or calm down. Um, and yes, yeah, similarly, there could be an emotional reason which maybe you want to kind of deal with first before you think about how you can motivate them. Um, I think providing a structure and routine is really, really helpful for this um, area. So you might want to do this visually so that timings are easy for your child to see. It's quite predictable. It lets them know what's expected of them. Um, and if you think about it at school, they will usually have timings and things on the board. So it's quite orientating. Um, it doesn't have to be time consuming or expensive. You don't have to spend ages creating a timetable. It can just be on a, a piece of paper. Um, it can be very simple or you can get free printouts online. Um, you might want to include pictures as well if that helps your child. Um, and it would be helpful if you have some similarity to the school routine, whether it's just, you know, waking up and brushing your teeth at the same time, but just to keep a little bit of 
um, similarity. Chunk work isn't the next strategy, so that can be really, really helpful just to break things into smaller chunks and have regular breaks and it just makes things feel more manageable and might encourage um, motivation slightly. Encouragement and praise is really important um, and especially when they have engaged in part of their routine or they've done a lesson that they really didn't want to do because it kind of encourages that, um, reinforces it and helps it to maybe happen again um, and it's a similar thing with rewards and that doesn't mean buying presents but it might be you know a break to watch their favorite program or having something nice to eat interest so sometimes something which helps with motivation is especially if someone's got low motivation is thinking about engaging in something that they're interested in first um, it, especially if it's something that they feel they're good at or they can't fail in, um, it kind of gives someone like a little bit of a boost and hopefully then can improve their mood and maybe then encourages them to engage in other parts of the routine. Um, control, so children are going to be more likely to do something um, if they feel like they've chosen to do it themselves so it kind of relates back to the forced choice slightly that Karen was talking about so where possible it's not always possible but allow children to feel control over what they're doing so even if the children um, sorry even if the choices are limited so it it can help them learn that um, some things are in their control um, when a lot of things aren't at the moment. Um, so it might just be choosing what order to do their work in um, or what they do during their break time. Even if you have a choice between different movements they do in their movement break, something like that. And lastly, environmental factors. So try and limit distractions where possible. Um, it's not always realistic in our current situation, but things like a quiet space, um, no toys around, no no screens that you don't need for the work. Um, and we know that some families struggle to find space and not every child or family um, will be able to have their own room um, or their own desk to work at. And that's OK. Um, a workspace can be any designated space where a child knows that's where they do their learning. So I'm going to hand back to Karen now to just touch on self-care. Thanks, Riri. Um, so as we come to the end of the workshop, we've spent a lot of time talking about how, sorry, I think it's, can you just mute yourself, Riri? Sorry, I think it's repeating back. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so as we come to the end of the workshop, I think we spent a lot of time talking about how you as your um, as parents can support um, your children. Um, however, we're very aware um, that you can only really do this when you're looking after yourselves. Um, and as we highlighted um, at the beginning, um, COVID has presented uh, a number of new challenges and stresses um, that we, we weren't prepared, prepared for. Um, and this is on top of all of the kind of daily stresses that um, everyone was already facing. And we often use the um, stress bucket exercise um, to help people think about um, their well-being. So um, maybe just for a second, um, imagine you have a bucket that you carry around with you, um, which slowly fills up as you experience different types of stress. Um, and uh, we've highlighted some of the kind of stresses at the moment on this slide. So uncertainty, uh, lack of social connection, exhaustion, homeschooling, um, financial worries, and sometimes you might feel strong and, and resilient enough to carry um, these different types of stress um, before you start to struggle. But sometimes if you're um, feeling quite vulnerable and um, your bucket might be um, small, it might fill up quite quickly. Um, and we know that if you don't use helpful coping strategies, um, your bucket can kind of um, begin to overflow. And that's when um, problems can start to develop. So the tap on this slide signifies um, uh, coping strategies which you can help to reduce the stress um, and to prevent the bucket from overflowing. 
So these coping strategies um, and self-care activities are going to be different um, for everyone and you're going to know what works best for you um, and kind of what's important for you. But we just wanted to discuss um, a couple of them um, today. So although um, I know it's really difficult at the moment, um, it's really important for parents just to find some time um, to look after themselves, um, so, which includes time for kind of rest and relaxation um, and self-care activities, um, time to connect with others and to do things you enjoy, and even if that's just for 10 to 15 minutes a day. Um, so yeah, even even time to do some of those breathing exercises or mindfulness that we talked about earlier that can really help with managing stress. Um, and as we mentioned um, when we were talking about kind of modelling um, emotion regulation, also modelling um, kind of it's important to model how you look after yourself and to show your child that um, that's that's something that's really important. Um, <clears throat> and we also just wanted to highlight that feeling stressed or finding things difficult at the moment um, can be a really normal reaction to this very abnormal situation. Um, and it can also be really normal for us to be um, kind of hard on our ourselves or to think we should be doing more or doing better or comparing ourselves to others um, but that can often make us feel worse and make us feel more stressed so where uh, possible try to use um, some self-compassion being kind to yourself and um, reducing the expectations on yourself um, and and the criticism and try to talk to yourself um, yeah in a kind voice um, how you might talk to kind of a friend um, and lastly, um, try to put, um, try not to put too much pressure on the academic work. Um, we know most parents aren't teachers, um, and it's okay not to be doing schoolwork every hour of the day or for six hours a day, like um, children would be doing at school. Um, and to think about what might be more important, say so spending time together, building relationships, connecting, as we talked about, enjoying shared activities. Um, and we know that schools still really want to support parents. Um, teachers are still working. So do contact your school, um, your child's school, if um, you want more support or advice um, or if you're struggling at the moment. Um, and um, yeah, and although it might sound kind of simple, remember to look after the basics in terms of kind of eating and drinking regularly, prioritising sleep and exercise. Um, and if you need to um, seek extra support and um, then um, kind of maybe do that if that's informally through kind of friends or family um, or if you need more um, kind of formal support from um, kind of other um, uh, services. And then just on the note, um, as we discuss kind of further support, um, if you are concerned about your child, um, about their behaviour or the worries that they're experiencing, um, then we would advise you to talk to the mental health lead or um, the SENCO at your child's school um, and they can help kind of identify and think about what support might be um, most helpful. Um, if your child does go to school um, in the Battersea area, um, then you um, might be able to access support kind of via our team that we talked about at the beginning. Um, so our email address um, is um, on the slide, so please do contact us um, if you would like um, further support. Um, but thank you very much for um, kind of joining us and watching the workshop today. Um, we hope you found it helpful um, and um, there'll be more kind of um, workshops available um, exploring different topics to help you support um, your children.